Hello, this is Paul Tercellini. Uh, I'm an engineer at the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I'm excited to kick off our 2022 Better Buildings Summer webinars today. Uh, we're going to be talking about large scale heat pumps and, in particular, um, geothermal heat pumps. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, go to the next slide. And you can continue on. All right, so just to kind of frame the discussion about heat pumps, uh, really heat pumps are moving heat from a colder temperature location to a warmer temperature. And today we're going to talk a lot about the heating side. Um, and uh, in order to make that heat move, we're going to put energy in. That refrigerant absorbs the heat, evaporates, and that refrigerant gas is compressed. And then it releases it when it is condensed at that high temperature. Um, it is a closed loop system so that no refrigerant is added or lost from the system. Uh, next slide. So when we talk about heating, uh, we actually put the building or a collection of buildings, as we'll see today, on the hot side. And so often we can take that low temperature either from the outdoors or from um, the ground um, and then put some energy in, usually electricity. Um, and in fact, we're going to focus on electrical solutions today to move that heat to that high temperature. Uh, next slide. And so some of what helps with the efficiency of this is that the smaller that temperature difference is from the low side to the high side, the easier it is to move that heat. So if it's cold outside, heating is more work. Um, but many heat pumps still work when that outside air temperature is very low. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about some larger scale systems and in particular, some ground source heat pump systems. And in that case, it's taking advantage that the ground is warmer than the air um, and that can improve the efficiency of that system. And so it minimizes the effort to really pump that heat from that low temperature to the high top temperature. Typically, it's two to five times more efficient to move the heat than it is to generate it such as with electric resistance heaters. Next slide. So when we're pulling that heat from the ground, you know, there's different ways of doing it. Um, that ground tends to maintain a pretty constant temperature uh, year round, um, which allows that heat pump to work more efficiently. In the summertime, we reverse the process and take the heat that's in the building and um, extract it and push it back into the ground. Now note that this concept of a ground source heat pump um, is different than um, natural hot water that you might find deep in the ground. And you think of something like um, geothermal, true geothermal resources like Old Faithful, where there's naturally hot water and steam coming out of the ground. Today, we're gonna to just focus on using the ground as a kind of a large scale storage mechanism um, where that, that heat is uh, pretty constant year round or that temperature is constant year round in the ground. Next slide. So um, a lot of times these are going to be large systems and we can talk about district scale geothermal heat pumps. And it's taking advantage of those temperatures that are a little bit deeper in the ground. Typical would be more than 30 feet and we've got a constant temperature between 50 and 59 degrees. And we're going to exchange that heat with the ground. And we could have many, many uh, boreholes or wells um, that are connected together in order to meet whatever that load is. The larger the system, typically we need more of these wells uh, to meet those loads. Um, we bring that uh, energy to the surface and we distribute it either with hot or cold water to buildings. And what we are seeing is, is that this is a technology we can use, and we'll see some examples later, to replace existing district systems. Sometimes we're using hybrid systems where we're still using a little bit of fossil fuel in the mix, uh, but you, relying primarily on uh, the ability to pump that heat uh, from the ground. Um, buildings can be slowly retrofitted and then added to the system as we go along. Uh, and we're gonna learn about you know, what has to happen on the building side as well as what's happening on the ground side today. Next slide. Um, we're seeing a rapid increase in the use of these technologies um, worldwide. And you can see some examples here of just um, the kind of the sheer magnitude of, of that information. 
Um, and that if you do something like this, and I hope that our speakers really bring this to light today, that you're not necessarily first, right? That this is a proven technology and that there are many people using this. And we're seeing about a 3% annual growth rate currently in the, in the United States with this. There are a large number of smaller systems that are residential, um, and we're seeing a growing number of commercial and especially large scale commercial. Next slide. Um, so at DOE, um, we have uh, different offices that focus on the technologies. Um, there is one dedicated to thinking about uh, geothermal technologies, and they are going to be putting out a, a funding opportunity an announcement on community geothermal heating and cooling systems. Um, and there's a little bit of discussion about on the slide about what this project is. Uh, it's really to encourage innovation approaches to making some of these large scale systems work and giving those examples. And so uh, there is some information available on the geothermal website, as well as being able to sign up for their newsletter if you want to stay current uh, with the information that's coming out of DOE. Uh, next slide. Um, I've also put on here a couple of other uh, resources if you want more information just about uh, heat pumps in general. Um, there are some short videos that, that discuss um, kind of how they work. Um, and there's also uh, more broadly an HVAC and water heating decarbonization guide that was put out by Better Buildings and is on the Better Building Solution Center. And that covers not only uh, the ground source, but also air source heat pumps. So if basically if you have an existing system today um, and it's using a fossil fuel, this kind of maps out what some opportunities are on the electric side. So next slide. All right, uh, let's move to the next slide. All right, so uh, today we are going to be using Slido as our um, engagement platform. And so um, you can enter the code, go to slido.com and enter the code DOE. Um, in this, you can um, ask your questions. Please do not use the Zoom portion for your questions, uh, but use Slido. And let's see, I think I lost the slides here. There we go. Um, and so please do join us at slido.com. And again, the hashtag DOE will get you in there. Okay, uh, next slide. All right, I wanna start off today with uh, some questions, give you a little practice with Slido, get you engaged with that. Um, and so I see results coming in now. So answering the poll, uh, we've got a lot of folks from local government and as well as some contractors and consultants. Um, and again, a lot of higher ed and some state governments. So definitely areas where we see opportunity for some of these large scales. So we'll give this just another second or so to kind of finish out. Scrolling up and down and seeing what some of our options are here. Um, great. So hopefully uh, um, we'll get you some of your questions answered and show you some good examples of uh, applications on the um, large scale heat pump side. All right, let's move to the next question. All right, so I uh, would like to know a little bit about your experience with heat pumps and if you've used them for HVAC systems. Um, And it looks like we've got a big crew that have over half have used them some of the time, uh, especially if we add most of the time. Um, and uh, you know, as we go along and maybe during the question part, um, you know, some of the concerns around the, the never category and what some of your thoughts are, we can have that discussion later on in the webinar. All right, let's move to the next question. And so the next question is, what is your primary motivation uh, for using heat pumps in HVAC systems? Definitely have a large majority that are thinking about it as a decarbonization strategy. And so I think our speakers will be able to address that uh, pretty directly as we go on. Okay, next slide. 
And then what are the barriers for using heat pumps for your HVAC systems? Um, so we had a lot of people who said sometimes, and so I'd like to you know, find out what your sometimes, uh, what would help you think about them more and what some of the challenges that you have are. Right around half uh, want to discuss the upfront costs. And I think our speakers will be able to talk about some of the hows and whys um, their organizations chose to use the systems they did. And so hopefully that will uh, give you some insight with that on how some others are doing this today. Um, and then next was lack of um, support, lack of knowledge uh, for these. I think our speakers can certainly talk about how they gained some knowledge um, around this and how they, they made it happen uh, in their facilities. Uh, and then there's one question, uh, uh, several people that have commented on the performance. And so uh, we can, again, hear from some people who actually own these systems and have used them on how they're operating for them. Okay, uh, next slide. Next question. Okay, so uh, thank you for your input on those questions. Uh, and so today we have a uh, esteemed panel of three speakers who are going to talk to us about the applications. Uh, we're going to start with um, Mike Walters from Salis O'Brien, uh, and he's going to be talking about a couple of different uh, locations and projects, uh, followed by Trent Yunker with Western Wisconsin Health uh, talking about his system that was installed. And then we're going to hear from Ted Borer from Princeton University um, about uh, what they're thinking and working on at that location. So uh, moving right along, uh, Mike, are you ready to go? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'd love to share our experience here today, and uh, we'll just kind of get right into it because we've got a lot of content. And as uh, we went through the questions there, I, I see uh, lots of good thoughts and comments and, and things we, we all, I think, can, can speak to. So next slide, please. Um, we'll, we'll go right into talking about two of our larger uh, district scale projects, uh, one which is already complete, which is Ball State University, and the second, which is uh, Miami uh, University in Ohio. Um, next slide. Ball State is a large system. Uh, as I mentioned, this project was was is completed already, and uh, I was actually as uh, we were preparing for this presentation, kind of looking up because it, it you know these large projects seem like you work on them for a long period of time, and indeed we did. And this project was completed. Uh, completely done uh, as much as eight years ago. The first phase of this was actually complete in 2010. So this pro this project and the system has been in operation for over a decade at this point. Um, you can see here um, it is a complete campus conversion. And if we um, kind of look at the map on the right side, there you can see two large uh, yellow blocks. There's a there's a large a vertical heat exchanger on the north side of campus and then a large vertical heat exchanger on the south side of campus and two uh, heat pump plants that are located immediately adjacent to each of those bore fields. In total, the system has almost 3,400 vertical bores at uh, the top uh, uh, field is um, 400 feet in depth and has eight, 1,800 vertical bores in that field and the bottom field has 1,583 heat exchangers in that field and those are at a 500 foot depth. Uh, Paul's slide earlier uh, showed the, the vertical depth can range pretty drastically anywhere from shallow bores of 150 feet or so in depth to uh, we've done projects in, in excess of uh, 2,000 feet in vertical depth but all, the vast majority of our projects are shallower than 850 feet below the surface. Uh, next slide please. Just sharing a little bit about the two district energy plants here. You can see here the, the pictures of the, you know, what what we commonly refer to as heat pumps. Really, this these are large scale um, uh, chillers, centrifugal chillers or screw chillers that are used in in these plants. Um, there were two uh, central plants here. Not huge facilities, right? Twelve thousand square feet for the north plant, a little over sixteen thousand for the south plant. Um, but, but putting large uh, heat 
heat pump chillers in both of those facilities. So, you know, in, in excess of 10,000 tons of, of capacity in both of those situations. And both of the plants were, were certified um, lead facilities at the time. If we go to the next slide, we'll see some uh, more specific statistics about uh, the, the scale of this uh, conversion project. So this was an existing central plant that had coal fired boilers and a steam distribution system. And it was completely converted to a ground source heat exchange system. Um, so that's a, an important piece to note. There's 47 buildings that had to be converted uh, from steam connections to hot water systems and, and, and low temperature hot water uh, systems. And you can see here that we, we operate these buildings now at 140 degree uh, supply hot water temperature. They were designed for 150 degree temperature. And we'll share a little bit about that. Um, and, and then relative to carbon reduction, this has been their largest project to date that has been part of their climate action plan to achieve carbon neutrality here. So they receive, or they achieve 50,000 tons of carbon reduction on an annual basis from implementing uh, this conversion project. And there's really two components that go into that. You can see at the bottom, there's a, a, a significant change in the energy use intensity for this campus. So we went from 175 kBTU per square foot per year to just over 100 after this project was completed. And that was due to eliminating the losses that exist in large scale steam distribution systems and, and converting those systems to low temperature hot water. And then, then obviously the efficiency that comes with using the heat pump in, instead of a, a gas fired boiler. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk just briefly about the, uh, the, the nexus of sort of temperature versus cost versus efficiency in these systems. And you can see a couple of, of other project uh, names on this uh, chart here. You can see Ball State was designed at 150. I said it operates at 140. But as you go lower and lower on the hot water temperature, the costs for doing the conversion frankly go up. You have more work that you have to do in the buildings to convert those to operate at low temperature hot water systems but you get much higher efficiency from a heat pump perspective. So that's, that's the kind of constant pressure in these projects is to, is to find the right hot water supply temperature for the equipment you wanna dispatch in the buildings you have and the existing systems that you have. Uh, next slide here shows how we look at um, Ball State's campus and you can see three campus maps. And what we did was we did hot water reset uh, on the, on the supply systems in the buildings to see what buildings show up in, in red or yellow on this map as buildings that, that have problems maintaining space temperature during very cold ambient conditions at 180 degrees, at 150 degrees, and at 130 degrees. And you can see the 130 degree map shows us a lot of buildings uh, start to fail at that supply temperature. And so that's why the 150 temperature was selected to, to optimize the amount of or minimize even the amount of capital investment that would be required in the buildings. Uh, this project, I should note, was, was completely done, vertical bore fields, the, the energy stations and the building conversions for approximately $85 million in, uh, in the 2010 through 20, 20, uh, 2014 timeframe. Uh, next slide here, uh, we'll show you just briefly some information about Miami University in Ohio. Uh, we could skip this uh, cover slide and go to the next one right away just to keep on path here. This is the central uh, energy plant or one of the central energy plants that was uh, developed as a part of this campus conversion. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see a complete campus map that shows uh, a large uh, distribution system that is completely a steam uh, distribution system. And the next slide shows what the process is that they're going through right now over a 15 or 16 year period here to convert the campus to ground source heat exchange, add uh, chiller plants and add thermal storage to this system to optimize how the, the performance happens here. The, the next slide really tunnels into the geothermal plant itself and shows the energy profile in 2018 for this, uh, this ground source heat exchange plant. And you could see the, the sort of dark red and dark blue is the simultaneous heating and cooling load that that facility is able to meet just with running the, the heat pumps themselves and not actually using the energy from a ground resource. And then the lighter shades here are, are where the, the heat pumps need to go to the ground and, and acquire more energy, either in the cooling uh, side, they have to reject energy to the ground or in the heating mode, they need to pull that energy and push it into the building. And the, the 
really interesting thing is, is this next graph on, on the next slide that shows the, the coefficient of performance for this plant. So you can see, if you're thinking about a gas boiler or electric resistance heating, the COP would be approximately one. And that during different periods of the year, this, this geo exchange plant is an extremely high performance resource for, for this university, uh, almost achieving a COP of eight in July, where, where we're really having just an exceptional energy performance there. And if we look on the next slide across the different plants this campus operates, you see it comparing coefficients of performance on an annual basis, you see the steam plant is, is below one. The, the chiller plant that has a, you know, very efficient centrifugal chillers in it is, is a very high efficient resource for them. And then uh, the geo exchange plant with 51% uh, provided uh, the energy out of there for heating and the other half for cooling is achieving that 5.1 uh, COP. Uh, the next slide is perhaps the most uh, interesting from a metrics and, and long-term performance of the current implementation of this conversion project where you see Again, a drastic reduction in energy use intensity. You see through 2020, we've, we've gone from right over uh, 165 kb2 per square foot per year. In 2020, we were, we were measuring somewhere in the around 85 to 90 range. And we expect that to continue to decline into the 70s as the rest of the project is implemented. You're seeing drastic you know, savings in utility costs, drastic savings in, in, in carbon reduction. And, and really um, just a kind of an, a, an amazing amount of utility cost savings that this program has been able to generate almost $80 million since the program started. So that's, that's just exceptional. And the next slide kind of shows how operating those plants with different COPs, what the cost comparison is for each of those plants. So it, it costs almost $6.30 per MMBTU to operate that steam plant versus the geo exchange plant, which is down in the 280 range. And that's related to labor cost savings. That's uh, commodity costs are certainly included in, in that oper operational number. And then just all of the, the chemical treatment and other activities that have to occur in a steam plant versus a geo exchange plant to, to really operate. Um, I have a few more slides I'll try to go through quickly. The next one is stepping out of the college and university space and just very quickly showing an application of a vertical heat exchanger and much smaller heat pumps in a community kind of residential uh, development perspective. So what you're seeing here is a development that is almost a thousand homes um, and, and the blue, dark blue lines in there indicate where uh, small vertical heat exchangers are have been developed in the, the public road network throughout this facility. And this is an ambient loop that moves through this development and heat pumps are in each one of the residential units and exchanging energy with that ambient loop and eventually with the ground. And this ambient loop is in series with all these buildings as opposed to distributing a four pipe system uh, through a campus or district energy kind of situation. Lots we could share about this project. I just wanted to put this here as another example of an application that's done very large, but not with monolithic uh, bore fields and in a much uh, smaller sort of commercial or re residential setting. And finally, I wanted to make a couple of points related to air source heat pumps. The next slide will show you uh, just a comparison of carbon emissions when you look at electricity versus gas uh, in an air source heat pump scenario, right? And, and particularly looking at a greening of the grid scenario. So you have the current electric grid in, in the blue line a 20% more efficient or less carbon intensive grid in the orange line and the current kind of gas uh, activity it, you look at from a boiler perspective, right? So you have the, the kilograms of CO2 per BTU of heating. And you can certainly see as, as you go um, from the 35 degree uh, inflection point on the current electric grid, if, if we continue to refine that, uh, and, and get more renewable electricity into that grid, you can operate air source heat pumps as, as low as five degrees Fahrenheit uh, from an outside air temperature and still be less carbon intensive than a gas heating system would be. If we look at the next slide, you'll see um, we're looking at air source heat pump efficiency. And this is kind of back to some information Paul started with where it's all about the amount of lift you have to do and, and driving towards a lower supply hot water temperature. So you see, 
the left uh, uh, axis there is the air source heat pump coefficient of performance and the blue line, the lowest temperature hot water is of course the highest efficiency because you're doing essentially less effort to, to create that, uh, that utility. And then the outside air temperature as you go warmer and warmer, the, the coefficient of performance in the air source heat pump continue to improve. Last slide I have is uh, just a, one more tunneling into this air source heat pump and cost efficiency and really looking at comparing air source heat pumps to a conventional steam plant. And you can see here, again, about the outside air temperature, as that goes higher and higher, the air source heat pumps uh, continue to get more and more competitive and, and, and begin to really beat the, uh, the, the cost effectiveness of operating a steam plant. So certainly happy to answer some questions later, but I'd like to transition to the next speaker. All right, thanks, uh, Mike. Um, I did uh, want to make sure I, I got a little bit of your bio in there, which I uh, neglected at the beginning of this, uh, but Mike is a principal with uh, the engineering firm Celso O'Brien and an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, in the School of Civil Engineering. And, I think that was a great presentation, talked about a lot of the different pieces and just the planning and how you have to really think about uh, sequencing through all of this. I've seen that many of you have uh, found the Q&A tab in Slido. Um, and so uh, please continue to put your questions into there. We've got lots of great questions coming in. We'll try to address as many as we can at the uh, end of the presentations. Um, also, if you there are questions there that you would like to give a thumbs up with, uh, we'll try to prioritize the most popular questions at the top of the queue when we go through those. So please kind of review those questions and indicate where your preferences are with that. Uh, and finally, a couple other housekeeping points I um, would like to cover is that we will be recording this webinar uh, and archiving it on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, there'll be a follow-up um, email when the recording and slides are available. And so uh, if you do have any issues, uh, you can certainly put something into uh, the Q&A box on the Zoom panel and it will go to our tech support team uh, if you need any assistance there. So let's uh, with that move to our second speaker uh, who is Trent Yunker, who joined Western Wisconsin Health in 2013 and, um, and had spent the previous 12 years in the architecture field as a project manager. And so he brings a broad range of experience with design and construction and project management in healthcare. I noticed that on the questions uh, that are, are coming up, uh, Trent, that there's definitely some interest in healthcare and people are eager to hear about uh, what you're doing. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Um, uh, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and and uh, look at things in a little smaller perspective. Um, you can go to the next slide if you want. Uh, so we're from Western Wisconsin Health. Uh, we are a, a small, uh, privately owned critical access hospital. Um, uh, our campus is 107 acres. Um, you can go to the next slide again. Sorry. Um, we're going to... Uh, I guess my goal today is to really to um, get you give a site overview, um, give a, a little bit of overview of our system performance, and then a, a really quick snapshot, I guess, of um, how it's performing today. Um, as I said, we're a privately owned organization. Uh, we're a critical access hospital, rural health clinic, and wellness center under one roof. Um, we have 107 acres. We developed about 35 of them for this project. Uh, the project we're talking about today is a, uh, a full-on replacement hospital. Um, in 2012, we began an initiative to replace uh, our existing aging facility. Um, our, uh, our, our choice um, to go with uh, a sustainable or renewable um, energy source was really led by, uh, really by our leadership's commitment to sustainability. Um, it was balanced with, I guess, what was attainable for us in, in the cost, um, from a cost perspective. And um, this is a little bit of a snapshot of how we got there and what it looks like today. 
Uh, we employ 400 staff. We're uh, a, a lead, lead silver uh, certified uh, building, uh, energy star rating of 91. You can go to the next slide if you'd like. Um, quick overview of our system. Uh, we have a, a horizontal um, geo exchange system. Uh, we have a loop field at 30, 15 feet depth and 30 foot depth, 176 loops. Uh, we have a, a multi-stack brand heat recovery chiller, um, domestic water preheat system, which uh, gives us the ability to, to preheat our water up to about 100 degrees prior to going into our domestic hot water system. And um, it also provides uh, heating for our pool water. Um, Around the building, we have VAV air handling systems with chilled beams and some traditional fan coils as well. Uh, all of our air handlers uh, do have um, air side energy recovery utilizing uh, energy conservation wheels and desiccant wheels for heat dehumidification. And we utilize uh, in-floor radiant heat on um, all of our slab on grade areas, or <clears throat> excuse me, around the perimeter of our building. You can go to the next slide. This is a quick look at what our campus uh, looks like. Um, we really had a, a, a broad uh, community vision when we chose this site and um, uh, really wanted to develop a campus that encompassed a succession of living and continuum of care. So you can see our, our hospital is the, the bright white uh, portion in the middle that's currently developed. Our geothermal exchange system is on the lower portion in the lighter brown. Uh, it's about seven, eight acres. Um, and then to the left of our building, we do have the darker brown area is uh, about six, six acres planned for a future solar array. So this building was really phase one in our long-term vision here for this campus. Um, the, the other buildings and areas you see on this, uh, this diagram are you know, some uh, retail and support space up in the top left, um, uh, independent living, and then um, assisted living and skilled nursing facilities would kind of complete that whole, um, that whole vision. You can go to the next slide. And now this is just a, a, a really quick look and a simple look at how our building is performing. Um, about in 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, after we kind of settled in, we started um, tracking our annual energy consumption. And uh, we're benchmarking this with a, uh, um, using a benchmark from a, a hospital energy survey put on by a, a firm out of the Milwaukee area um, includes about 130 hospitals in kind of mostly the Great Lakes area. Uh, there are some sprinkled out there in the, the eastern and western and southern parts of the country, but um, this is a look at our, our building. Uh, we're, we're in that 98, uh, 100,000 BTUs per square foot per year over the last couple of years. Um, 2022 is, is is coming along nicely um, on the month a uh, month to month look we are kind of right on track with previous years, uh, but that target or mean used on this was um, was the mean used for or from that energy survey, and uh, um, in full disclosure, there's a much larger uh, much la much larger facilities. Uh, we're on the smaller end of of the square footage of those, um, and probably on the newer end too. So um, this is what we're we're looking at annually. And go to the next slide. Uh, look at the past two and a half years of monthly energy consumption in B2s per square foot. Um, as you'd expect, uh, we have a, um, the graph trending upwards and, and then back downwards uh, as we enter and leave the heating season. Uh, you can go to the next slide. This is an interesting one. Uh, total monthly gas consumption. We are not full. Uh, full um, on sustainable uh, renewable energy. We do have gas fired boilers that supplement our geo exchange system uh, and um, they are needed. Uh, maybe one of the biggest lessons we learned um, in, in this whole process and operating this building is that uh, our ground isn't as, um, isn't as efficient as we had hoped. Uh, water temperatures aren't sustained as, as long into the heating season as we'd like, and they don't come back as, as much as we'd like. Uh, our building is actually uh, on the heating dominant side versus a cooling dominant side, which I think uh, the engineering 
companies would tell you that's maybe not typical for um, healthcare. At least it wasn't typical in our in our building model that we we generated here. But um, so we use we use gas fired boilers to supplement um, a little bit during the heating season. And if you were to flip this graph upside down, our uh, our groundwater temperature actually trends the same direction as this. And so kind of gives you a, an idea of um, the efficiency of, of our system right now. You can go to the next slide. Uh, total monthly electric consumption. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, typical of what we'd expect, um, but different than maybe your tip, uh, a system that has a rooftop chillers that fire up during the summer and you see those spikes and valleys uh, for electric consumption. And go to the next slide. That's a quick one for today. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a real quick look at how our how our system is performing. Um, some of the advantages we've seen are operating costs. Uh, utility costs play a large role in that, but uh, if we can keep our, our consumption down, then uh, utility costs should follow. Um, the other thing that we've we've noted in, in operations here is that. Um, Water flow and water temperature uh, and, and water chemistry are uh, really paramount for our system to be operating properly. I, I look forward to any questions. Hopefully I can answer them, but uh, we'll transition into the, the next uh, presenter. I thank you for the time. Okay, uh, thanks Trent, that was great. Uh, just a quick reminder that uh, if you do have questions to add them to Slido, slido.com, the hashtag is DOE. Um, and we look forward to trying to answer as many of those questions as we can. We're, we're getting a lot of great questions. And so we will uh, address what we can at the end of the presentation. So uh, our final speaker today is um, Ted Bohr. And um, Ted is with uh, Princeton University Energy Plant Director, uh, actively involved in the campus energy and carbon emissions reduction effort and strategic plans. Um, and he has been involved with this industry for 36 years, uh, speaks regularly on these topics, and we look forward to hearing what you're doing at Princeton. Hey, Paul, thanks a lot. And as Paul said, uh, I'm a total nerd for this stuff. I absolutely love it. Um, next slide. What I'd like to do is walk you through uh, where we are as an institution and then point to where we're going, which I think is really more of, of interest today. So next slide. Here's the problem that's on my desk, that's on Paul's, that's on Trent's, that's on Mike's, and ideally it's probably on yours too. Um, in a lot of words, this says we need to save the planet but we can't make up the rules right now. Uh, and we still have to keep the core business going. Um, in the energy uh, plant, we are a support uh, function. We're not core business. So we need to leave the education, the research. And um, the other thing that I think Paul underscored early is we need to do this with financial stewardship. We need to uh, spend our money wisely because even if some of these institutions could throw lots of money and save the problem, uh, eliminate the carbon footprint, if we don't do it in a way that's financially responsible, nobody else will follow us. So we can't be impactful unless we pencil it out and say, in fact, what we're doing is the lowest life cycle cost uh, for the institution. And, and we can talk about that later. Next slide, please. The university has about uh, 9 million square feet, 9.5 million square feet. We're growing rapidly um, by far. Um, as uh, the other speakers alluded, the, the research is the most energy intense. So a lot of reasons, um, the energy plant is really in service to the research buildings because of the high reliability needs, because of the energy intensity and the other buildings come along with. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, for those who want the numbers, top right-hand corner shows that we use about 27 uh, million watts, 27 megawatts on the uh, very hottest day of the summer, the peak of the day. Um, I can make 15 megawatts with a gas turbine, a jet engine, um, which is what I think of as controllable power generation. And then we have another 16 and a half uh, megawatts of solar. So um, in the 
uh, utility industry, we talk about this as a very high penetration of renewable energy, which the university is going to demonstrate um, how that can work well, um, having a very high uh, amount of renewable energy and only supplementing it, kind of like uh, what I think Trent was saying, only supplementing it with uh, combustion or fossil fuels when absolutely necessary. In terms of heating the campus, we need 240 million uh, pounds of steam an hour. We do that with the exhaust heat from the gas turbine or from auxiliary boilers, primarily burning natural gas again, diesel fuel as backup. And in terms of chilled water, we can make chilled water with steam driven chillers or with electric driven chillers. Uh, we have about half half in terms of our needs. So most days when it's not the peak demand day, we have a choice. Do we want to burn uh, natural gas, make steam, and run a steam-driven chiller, or do we want to purchase electricity or generate electricity and run an electric-driven chiller? We also have uh, energy storage, not in the form of batteries, but in the form of daily thermal storage. Um, it's a chilled water thermal storage tank, and what we do is we buy power when it's very inexpensive. We cool off two and a half million gallons worth of water, and then we can shut off our electric chillers and shut off our electric cooling towers and simply deliver water from this tank for um, anywhere from four to 10 hours. And we can deliver uh, up to two thirds of our peak cooling demand on the very hottest day for, for four hours. That thermal storage tank looks an awful lot like 40 megawatt hours of electric storage and, and uh, functionally we use it the same way. Next slide. The cogeneration system is illustrated here, gas turbine on the left, uh, spinning an electric generator on the right. It's about one third efficient. If I put a unit of fuel in, you get about one third of that fuel energy out as useful electricity. And so it would be very poor to, to operate that in a, what we call simple cycle uh, mode. But if we take the hot exhaust gas, it comes out at 1800 Fahrenheit, we can run, um, that exhaust gas through a boiler and we can make steam. And the overall process shown on this slide is about 80, 85% efficient, sometimes uh, down around 75 and sometimes higher. So the overall co-generation process is 75% um, or 80% efficient. And I think um, one of the previous speakers mentioned uh, that's, not, that's not unusual. That's about right for um, plants of this vintage and for boilers. Next slide. Here's our chilled water with thermal storage. So what we can do is run the chiller and we reject heat through a cooling tower back to the environment. And we can cool off two and a half million gallons of water. And then the thermal storage decouples the time of production from the time of need. So if the chiller, or really I should say when the chiller fails or when the cooling tower fails, um, the operator can just turn up a variable frequency drive on a pump and they can pump water out of the um, chill water uh, thermal storage tank and deliver cooling to the campus and the researchers and the other uh, customers on campus have no idea that there was a problem in the plant. So we decouple the problems from the plant uh, from our customers. And also we now have the opportunity on a good day to buy power when it's cheapest and avoid the purchase of power when it's most expensive. Next slide. I think of the energy plant as a big energy conversion box. Um, I buy electricity and natural gas and liquid fuels, and I get a gift from the universe of uh, solar, of sunshine, and we convert each of those inputs into electricity and steam and chilled water. Next slide. Our goal is to get to carbon neutrality. Our stated goal is uh, get to carbon neutrality by 2046. Currently, uh, we're responsible for about 100,000 metric tons of carbon emissions a year. Um, and we know that it, we're not gonna just count on not doing nothing, 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 and then magic in the very last year. We're gonna drive towards a linear downward slope from today to 2046. And the bulk of that will be converting buildings from steam heating um, and steam hot water to all uh, hot water district energy. And then we're gonna, in the green um, triangle, we're gonna need to power all of that hot water district energy uh, with renewable electric input. I expect we're gonna drive our combustion down and down and down, but we won't get to zero combustion. Right now we uh, burn 
natural gas, maybe 8,500 hours a year. I expect to very quickly go from 8,000 to 4,000 to 2,000 and maybe 1,000 hours of uh, combustion. And eventually we'll have to do that with biodiesel uh, or some other renewable fuel. Next slide. This is walking you from the building all the way out to the energy source in terms of the different things that we're touching on campus to reduce our carbon footprint. So in the existing buildings, we're gonna to have to retrofit the building, uh, tighten it up in a lot of cases, air sealing, insulation, uh, lights changing, uh, very classic work to tighten up each of the building envelopes. Any new building will be a high performance um, envelope. And to the extent we can, we're gonna to try to meet a, what's called a passive house uh, design standard. All new buildings and all major retrofits will be um, hot water heating. The next thing we'll do is, we're, or right now we are actively replacing our district steam system with a district hot water system. But obviously we need to install 13 miles of hot water pipe before we rip out 13 miles of steam pipe, or at least we need to have each building uh, operating on hot water before we can remove the steam. So it's, it's uh, quite a ballet that we're doing on campus right now. Um, we have to create, and in fact, we're creating two new uh, electric powered heat pump facilities, one on the main campus and uh, one on a satellite campus that we're building in a greenfield effort. Um, we will add both hot and cold water uh, thermal storage for this daily uh, buy low and deliver to our customers when energy is valuable. Um, and that daily uh, reliability and resilience that thermal storage adds. And then we will create seasonal energy storage. I have a lot more heat removal I need to do in the summer than heat uh, and more heat delivery that I need to do in the winter. So we will store, um, as Paul mentioned, uh, in geo exchange or uh, really, yeah, in, in geo exchange well fields, we'll capture the heat from the summer, store it in the well fields during the uh, summer and late summer, and then we will deliver it to the campus uh, late in the year in, or when it's cold out. We're going to bolt uh, solar photovoltaic to anything that doesn't move on campus. Uh, and then that won't satisfy all our electric needs. So we'll buy electric uh, renewable energy from off campus. Next slide. Uh, we're needing to replace the steam system that's more than 100 years old. And so rather than committing to another century of steam heating, we're going to move to uh, hot water heating, which is many, many times more efficient. Next slide. Right now on the right, we're adding heat by burning stuff in boilers and delivering heat to campus. And on the left, we're adding heat, adding energy, and we're removing heat from campus and throwing it away through cooling towers. So what we're gonna do uh, is combine those two. Next slide. Using heat pumps, we will pull heat out of the chilled water system and deliver it to the hot water system. You see there's no longer a cooling tower and uh, you see that there's no longer the combustion process in the boiler. So uh, as the others alluded, probably five to six times more efficient um, through the coefficient of performance of the heat pumps. Next slide. Um, you've seen this idea previously, but the red is uh, heat delivery to the campus during the winter. The blue is heat removal from the campus in the summer. You can see a nice match in the shoulder months. And you can see that I need to capture heat during the summer and store it in geo exchange and then deliver it maybe six months later, uh, extracting that heat from the ground and delivering it to the uh, campus in the winter. Next slide. You can see an architect's rendering of the plant. We're actually uh, framed out, the roof is on. Uh, it's not yet populated with the equipment and you can see the hot and the cold thermal storage tanks in the background. Next slide. And you can see that, as I said, we're decorating anything that stands still on campus uh, parking decks, flat surface lots, uh, a few large fields. We have about 60 acres of solar PV and some building tops. I think that's where I want to land it. And uh, we'll move on back to Paul and then on to some questions. Okay, thanks, Ted. Uh, yes, so continue to kind of upvote questions uh, on Slido. We've got about 10 minutes uh, here for questions. Um, and let me start with the panel on how are you paying for these systems? Um, 
you know, are they internal budgets? Uh, are you growing it on trees, grants, uh, third party ownership and management of equipment? What, what are the strategies out there you're using? Uh, I guess I'll offer a couple of quick, quick comments, specific to Ball State and Miami. Those are both essentially publicly funded institutions. So the, the, the states paid for those systems to be implemented. At Ball State, there was actually a DOE grant uh, for $5 million. So I don't know if you knew that, Paul, or not, but uh, that was part of that project uh, back in the day. Um, a lot of the work at Miami uh, was, it was all funded internally, but it was funded as part of, um, you know, regular processes to upgrade and maintain buildings or you know upgrade facilities at the end of their useful life so they they waited as they were turning over their dormitory facilities right to, to upgrade those to, to more modern facilities they did the conversion work in the buildings as part of those projects so that that was an incremental cost to the essentially the utility side of the equation but we are seeing certainly third-party providers uh, you, you know, with very much interest to get into this space and provide funding resources to, to institutional uh, campuses. That's, you know, that's a choice that every campus needs to make or, or not make. Ted, I'm sure you have some perspectives on that. Yep. Uh, so I'll take off where uh, Mike left off. Um, we are private um, and self-funded for a lot of these projects. Uh, for the solar, we're using a power purchase agreement model where somebody else uses their money, they bolt their stuff to our property. And then we guarantee that we'll buy the output from the solar. In terms of the um, steam I already mentioned, we have a lot of deferred maintenance. The steam pipes that we're running, some are, uh, many are built before the First World War. They're more than a century old. We need to renew those. We'd be foolish to replace in kind. We want to replace with the uh, you know, best available technology, which is uh, district hot water. Um, that is uh, self-funded. And we've established an internal fund, and I won't go into the details of that, but it's that's uh, looking at the life cycle cost. We've determined that the life cycle investment of a hot water system is going to put us in much better shape than if we had continued with the steam model. All right, uh, Trent, you want to talk about how yours are financed? Yeah, so our, our project was uh, through some subsidies, um, renewable energy subsidies, uh, state and federal, um, and then uh, privately funded. Uh, we, we went through um, major fundraising efforts to make our, make our project a reality. Uh, so a lot of local support um, on a smaller scale here for Western Wisconsin Health. Um, and to, to mirror Ted's comments, um, our, our solar array, um, is we're working on it currently and it's gonna be through a, a power purchase agreement. I wanna um, uh, respond to one quick question. In terms of the solar renewable energy uh, assets in New Jersey, I can sell the green tags. Um, we have sold the green tags from our first four and a half megawatt field up till now. Uh, we're gonna begin retiring those. So to date, I've made no carbon footprint reduction claim associated with any of the green tags that we've sold. Uh, we uh, account for that at utility emissions rates. And we're gonna do that going forward unless we are, and until such time as we're retiring those wrecks. Okay, um, so question I think specifically for Mike, others can chime in as well. Uh, the question was the Ball State project was completed 10 years ago. Why do you think this type of central plant conversion has not been widely copied since then? Uh, well, I was trying to wear out my fingers typing back some answers to a bunch of questions uh, while, while uh, Trent and Ted were talking, but I, I actually do think it's being wild, widely copied. Um, we have, um, we, we often have people reach out to us and say, hey, what, what else can we learn about the Ball State project? We're thinking about doing that ourselves. Uh, it, if I were to present the the scale of the kinds of projects we're working on currently, it's coast to coast, uh, you know, from Canada through the Mexican border. Um, we probably have three or four dozen projects of scale like this that are either in various stages of being completed or planned or, you know, in, in fund, fundraising mode. Um, and that's, you know, that's in all geographies of the country, all climate zones, I think. It is the topic that we get called about and that we see the most requests for proposals and study work out in the industry right now. I'll jump in and say yeah. a lot of my peers at the International District Energy Association I meet with 
Um, pretty much everybody who's got a big campus uh, is, is moving in this direction. Um, I'd be surprised if any of my major peers are doing otherwise, uh, but it is typically somebody who anticipates their organization institution is gonna be there for a while. We have uh, relatively longer payback periods, but um, many of our institutions are gonna be here for uh, decades ahead. And this is by far the best uh, long-term strategy. So yeah, I, I, I will say just quickly, Paul, that, that it is not an easy uh, planning effort. It is not an easy project to you know, gestate through the decision-making process inside of an existing institution or campus or even through a new development process. So. You know, Ted said the life cycle cost analysis work needs to be, you know, baked into this process. And you're looking at, you know, 30 year modeling timeframes or longer. Uh, and you have to really get into a lot of weeds. You have to get into your chemical treatment costs, your deferred maintenance program, your staffing needs, uh, you know, the commodity forecasts, what's going to happen in regulatory markets relative to the carbon, you know, incentive programs. There's a a broad array. And I do think that's one of the things that slows the adoption of this and slows the progress of why aren't there 15 more projects like Ball State that are already done? Because it's it's pretty difficult. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw in one more thing to Mike's comment. Um, there are tremendous water savings with this that most people do not realize. And for states that are drying out um, or locations that are fighting over water, this is a really big deal to implement this. And I think a lot of people don't realize that yet. Trent, do you want to talk about some of the replication potential here? I don't know if I have a good answer for that, Ted or Paul, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll move on here. Um, I, I do like, uh, you know, Mike talked, uh, well, all the speakers talked about the planning. I, I do like the, the graphics on the different temperature regimes, right, for the buildings that will and won't work. And I would certainly like to encourage listeners as you're doing any set of renovation or maintenance, really think about how you can lower the temperature of the water that the building needs and kind of being prepared to move in this direction, even if that means you're still using you know, some kind of fossil fuel, but you know, in terms of the efficiency, I mean, looking at what those building loads and how much those piece of equipment are being used is a first good step here uh, to take in terms of long-term planning. And I, I think one of the messages, it is long-term. Uh, we did have a question, you know, and I know Ted, you mentioned about, you know, aging steam lines and having to replace steam lines. Um, there was a, a question comment about needing to replace steam lines and, you know, in 30 years, are we gonna to have to replace all these geothermal lines, right? So what kind of longevity, talk a little bit about the longevity of what you're expecting out of these systems. Yeah, I think Trent and Mike will echo this, but in the utility business, um, we really think in terms of a half century to a century investment. So the steam lines that were put in before the first world war are still lasting, they're still working, but we really do need to replace them at some point. What we're building, designing today we're really planning for at least a 50, and I really expect 75 to 100 year life out of what we're installing. So this is a, you know, it's a once in a century type event. I, I feel the same way, Ted, yes. It's for certainly all of the horizontal infrastructure and the vertical heat exchanger, that is a, a many decade uh, useful life kind of investment. And, you know, if there's, I would not be surprised at all if those are 100 year assets for sure. And, and we've um, demonstrated that with the stewardship of our existing system. Right. Okay. Um, so, and there are definitely lots of other questions related to maintenance and transition of maintenance, which I don't think we're going to have a chance to uh, get to unless Trent, if you want to talk a little bit about maintenance on yours. Uh, and we had about sure. one minute here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, biggest maintenance uh, um, item to consider on ours has, has been water chemistry. And uh, we are we are seeing um, we are seeing uh, our strainers um, plug up a little more than we'd like to. Uh, we're we're um, looking at uh, um, adding some bypass functions to allow uh, more serviceability to those types of systems. But uh, water chemistry tends to be uh, our biggest challenge right now, and um, and then also just from the heating and cooling uh, on, of, of the water, and mostly on our hot water side of our system, but then also. When we see those times and shoulder seasons of simultaneous heat, heating and cooling and our geo 
field or geo pumps turn off and it becomes stagnant and then they fire back up again. So uh, that continuous flow of water um, should be considered and, um, and maybe even um, burn a little bit more electricity, just keeping that water moving to get the keep the chemical circulating and, and the chemistry um, in balance. So really from us, that's that's the biggest one. And, and I should note, we, we do use a 100% water system here too. We don't have any glycol. Um, maybe Great. maybe odd for Wisconsin, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I wanna thank all of our speakers uh, as we wrap this up. This is uh, part of the 2022 Better Building Summer Webinar Series. And as you can see, we have a, a great line of presentations. I mean, the, the questions for this were great, very in depth. So I uh, encourage you to join us for some of our other webinars. You can visit the Better Building Solutions Center to learn more and to register. Uh, the next webinar is going to be on June 21st um, and it's industrial demand response. And so you can join this webinar and learn about the Better Plants program and um, develop guidance around demand response for industrial partners. I'm sure there's also things to learn here about uh, commercial, especially the large scale uh, commercial projects. Uh, I also want to highlight the um, DOE um, release of the annual report with the key findings, updates, and metrics from the Better Buildings Initiative. And so you can visit the Better Building Solutions Center to explore the 2022 progress report to learn about how DOE and the partners are working towards a more energy efficient future. And so with that, we are at the top of the hour and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And I'd like to especially uh, thank our panelists um, and you can reach out to them uh, if you have follow on questions. And thank you for attending today's webinar.